going to record on this computer. Okay, we are all on Memorex now. So uh, we will do this. We'll start this uh, case study on Monday. Um, let me give you a little bit of foreshadowing and then we'll go act actually to today's. Uh, I think a portable network graphic will load. It's a little bit too big. We'll we'll try that on the uh, internet. Um, but that this will give you an idea of the scale of our model building capabilities. Um, I don't know if a TIFF will load in Jupyter Lab. Okay, let me get um, logged into the Amazon thing and we will start. Still waiting on um, Jawad, but there's no telling what the traffic's like in wherever in the world he is right now. I know it's 12 hours from here, but I actually don't remember the city. Okay, so that's set up. Shrink that. Go here. AWS instances and go through the whole login procedure yet again. By the way, on Monday when we do that county scale model, I'm curious to see if we'll even run on the uh, light sale instance. God, what the heck letter is that? A Q or a G? We'll go with G. G D two. Okay. <laughs> There's Elon Musk's little rocket ship going back and forth. And we are in this instance here. Connect. Sweet. Little spinning thing, which is a way of telling us that their time is worth more than ours. I will endure additional spinning to get a little bit more screen real estate. And this is what the inside of a black hole looks like. So, oh, that's actually scary. But network performance <laughs> low to moderate. Um, I don't remember seeing it give me warnings like that anymore, but we are actually pushing this particular little instance harder than it was ever meant to be done. So if it's a fail, we will go, I, I'll go ahead and um, upgrade to something a little bit more capable. There we go. So there is our class right now. Let me update that instance. And if you recall, Last time we had done essentially what I have labeled here as Houston Steady.inp. I've created another file, which is my fallback for my failure when it occurs or if it occurs on turning the steady into the unsteady model. I'm going to leave these two on the server for the time being. And we'll go ahead and we'll start our swim program. And if you recall from last time, we basically had done the we had done the initial layout. And I I was gonna say I wish I'd get a recording of this because it'd be pretty cool to show the uh, limited amount of memory we're actually running this in. But I am making recording of it, so I can show that off uh, when the uh, venue is correct. Let's reopen our Houston model. Wow, it didn't even demand that I uh, 
but in a backdrop. I wonder why that is. Probably because they. Houston base. Okay, so there was our um, our Houston model. Um, let me make a few changes that I noticed I had done incorrectly. So the invert elevation at this location is around minus 16 feet, not zero. This one is around minus eight. Is that right? Yeah, that's a plus 25, minus 16. I got to split the difference between minus 16 and plus 25. So 25 and 16 is 35, 41. Half of 41 is 20-ish, so we'll go with 20-ish. And that's how engineering is done in the big world of computer modeling. Um, and then if we're paid by the hour, we would put that into a spreadsheet to confirm that it's 20-ish. This is correct at 25. This should be like about six feet. Yeah, that one's wrong. So 25 and six is 31. We'll put the 0.5 there for fun. And then this one should be 50 minus six would be 44. So that should get the bottom elevations correct. Um, and then I'm gonna leave White Oak by you alone because I'm afraid I'll break something. So this was where we left off last time and we set our, our stage last time at a ridiculous value, but I'll leave it at 31 feet for the time being. And we can run our simulation and it's all happy and it took 2.67% error and we don't have any profiles drawn. Let's go ahead and pull up a profile. We'll do the one going from White Oak down to the outfall. Works better if you do it correctly. And there is kind of our setup right now. And if we go over here to our, uh, let's run the animator because that's easier than me clicking stuff. And we'll animate the flow and um, you can see stuff bouncing around. That's a consequence of the numerical method. Let's see, we're keeping the inertia terms. Let's dampen things a little bit and we'll rerun it just for grins and then we'll go back to a full dynamic routing. I believe if we dampen the wiggles, although I don't think that's the technical term, they uh, start to dissipate a little bit. So there, there's our um, initial setup. And our goal is to actually look at the um, time dependent input. So we have a white oak input hydrograph, and we want to put that into this node up here. So I'm going to turn off the backdrop so I can see what I'm doing. So we unload that, and we have a node up here if we want to put a input hydrograph there. And since you guys are all experts, oh, that's me being just a smart aleck. Uh, since the point of this is to test now your longer term memory, um, how would we put an input hydrograph? We'd go to inflows and then which of the little clicky doodle things would I click on to put in a hydrograph? Uh, isn't it time series? Yay, yes, you are correct. Um, cool. So. I'm not going to click on it just yet because I don't actually have the hydrograph downloaded just yet. So let me get that hydrograph. Buffalo input hydrograph. Right click, nothing happens. Hmm. 
you know, it should ask me where I want to send it. I want to I'm gonna go try find my place back where um, we have all the data located. Local disk C program files x86 swim nothing. Oh, my file management just really stinks on this. Well, let me save it to the desktop because I'll be able to find it there. And we're going to get the White Oak input hydrograph. We'll download that. What should... Really, I want to download it. Quit making up work for me, you silly machine. And um, the other thing we're going to need is a downstream boundary condition. Uh, I'm going to download two, but um, We'll actually just use the downstream stage, but let me download the other one so you can see what it looks like and uh, see how we um, how we convert from a flow hydrograph to a stage hydrograph, which is ironic that we have to do that because the way the data are originally measured are in stage and then they're converted to flow. So it's sort of stupid, but that's that's just how it is. Buffalo flow, save that in downstream stage. Save that. Now before I leave our data repository, if you were presented with a flow hydrograph, so that would have um, information like time, some sort of time, and then a uh, I guess he's not going to join us today. I'm sure he'll send me an email and tell me why. Um, if you had a flow hydrograph, normally it would have um, pairs of data. One of the elements is time. So it might be time of day or elapsed time. The other one would be a discharge value in something like cubic feet per second. And so how do you relate that back to stage? or actually think the question backwards. If we're measuring stage, how do we recover discharge? It's somewhere on the computer screen in front of you. The file type is rich text format. And other than actually there's only two there that are RTF formats. So um, just like who wants to win a million bucks, 50-50 uh, chance, or do you want to call a family member or would you like to ask the audience? Reading. Yay, okay, you just won a million bucks, Anna. You don't have to do this engineering stuff anymore. Um, yeah, the rating, Cool, it will download and open it for me. The rating curve is what relates depth to discharge. As Microsoft products ask, ask an awful lot of questions. They're worse than Apple. <laughs> I wanted to open it in a spreadsheet, so it immediately assumes that I want to open it in a document. But the rating curve is how we convert stages into discharges. Okay, so that's been done. Um, let's see if I can exit this. Don't want to exit LibreOffice. I want to close the document. That's been done, and that was what is in the downstream stage hydrograph based on the flow hydrograph, which is actually how, it, how I did it. Um, but in general, the stage hydrographs are normally supposed to be available. The reason being a stage is what actually gets measured. 
because measuring stage is is pretty simple nowadays and it even was back then in the 1990s but measuring discharge is not simple although that has also changed considerably in the last 30 years um, to where in your guys career there you'll you'll probably start to get access to direct flow measurements there's there's tools to do it but 30 years ago those tools were beyond cost prohibitive because the Navy hadn't even admitted they could do that yet. Um, nowadays, um, 10 years ago, the tools were in the $20,000 installation per installation range. And they're, they're now quite a bit less than that. There's still the, um, the real estate issue of being able to get permission and access to do the installs. So I imagine in your guys' careers, uh, direct flow measurements are gonna be um, relatively common. So the shenanigans we're pulling off here, uh, you, you might not have to do uh, later on. Okay, so now we've, now we've downloaded the data and I wanna make some room to see what I'm doing. Hit the shrink button on that. Let's do the input hydrograph first. So we're gonna get the spinning beach ball and we're gonna attempt to open it with LibreOffice Calc. Yeah. Hopefully they got the message. Did you know? Yeah, whatever you just said. And the way now we would transfer this information into our swim program is the way we've always uh, been doing stuff, is we would gravify all the values. Normally I would plot this, I'll just plot it and swim so you can see what the uh, input hydrograph looks like. Oh, you. Uh, this is chance where normally I would use profanity, but I'm on video right now. It decided to uh, ignore my drag and drop. And if the data series are longer than, than this, and this is actually getting on the, on the longish side, um, we would simply use our Python scripting tools or our scripting tools, or God forbid, Visual Basic for applications in Excel. And we would, we would automate this step. We'd have it pull the data from the file and write it into our modeling program. So let me copy that, go swimming. This is Buffalo input upstream. And as we've already established, we wanna click on the time series, doodle, hit paste, 95104. Cool, and these are in 15 minute increments. So there's a bunch of them. Um, I think it goes up to about 90 hours. So that, that's a bunch of information. There's what Buffalo Bayou upstream uh, looks like. Now these are design hydrographs taken from the Harris County Flood Control District. So I'm pretty sure this represents a 100 year um, a 1% chance design hydrograph for Buffalo Bayou at town Houston. And it is set so the peak is at about, let's see, 10, 18 hours. And unfortunately the graphic tool that's built in to swim um, doesn't actually easily allow us to extract where the peak is, but we don't really care. So it's peaking at 18 hours relative to hour zero. Hit close, let's give it a name. Buffalo up, not a very creative name, but it'll do. Press okay. And now we've, now we've changed at least this input location from a steady value of flow to a non-steady. 
Now we'll do the same for white oak. So we're actually going to uh, skip a few steps that were done in the, if you read the paper, you would see that the authors of the paper, and yes, I was one of them, uh, we did one where we did an agreed upon base flow in Buffalo and an agreed upon base flow in White Oak Bayou. And that was mostly to convince the client that the fancy uh, three dimensional model um, produced output that looked like what it would look like if we went out to the bayou on any arbitrary day when it wasn't raining. Um, further background, these two bayous nowadays, I mean, they are natural systems, but most of the base flow in them is treated wastewater. So that those base flow values are actually quite well known. Um, they're based on totalizer meters coming out of wastewater treatment plants. Between the two bayous, uh, there's, I think, 32 wastewater treatment plants that discharge into them upstream of these locations. No, no, there's 30 because the, the two big ones are in the downstream end. And um, so those that value was known. So we, we did base flow. We went out to the site, took photographs, and went out with the uh, clients and our computer model. And the photographs looked close enough to each other. It's like, OK. Uh, we can model nothing going on, which is an important step, silly as that sounds right now. Um, then we um, put a 100 year design hydrograph on the Buffalo Bayou and left White Oak alone, just let it go at base flow, which sounds implausible, but in, in Houston and actually other major metropolitan areas, um, there are uh, defendable instances where multiple tributaries, one of them will receive rainfall, the other one won't. And that, that does happen in real life, although admittedly a 100 year on one and nothing on the other seems pretty unlikely to me. And then we switched the 100 year on White Oak and base flow on Buffalo and then finally hit the two with their design hydrographs. We're just going to go straight to the design hydrographs now because part of what I'm trying to convey to you is um, how to actually do it, or how, how you put the uh, data in. Although at this point, it's obvious I'm just going to cut and paste from another uh, spreadsheet. Okay, let me close that one. Hopefully that closes it. Oh, it behaves just like my home machine. It doesn't necessarily want to respond. And then here's our white oak input hydrograph. So let's go ahead and open it. Open with. Oh, we got to do it twice for sure, for sure. And um, same process as before. We'll capture the data, go to our topological layout time series. Paste, take a look at it. Um, this one still has that broken part between hour 18 and hour 30. I'll leave that B for the time being and we'll go back and figure out how to fix that. So this is White Oak. Again, not a very creative name, but it'll do for tonight. Choose OK and save it. So now we've changed the upstream boundary conditions. We'll go ahead and run it right now just for, for fun. Our downstream boundary condition is a fixed stage of 31.5 feet, which is absolutely ridiculous that, that, that it's a fixed stage, but it will. Um, It'll give us a, a starting point to see if we've broken something else. Okay, so that's desirable. It, it ran. There's no expectation that the output is at all correct. Let's go look in the um, most upstream conduit on White Oak, and we should get our hydrograph back. 
possibly attenuated a little bit, but it should look the same. I would say, yeah, it does. Uh, we do the same on buffalo. And that seems reminiscent of what we put in. Uh, at this downstream end, we would expect it to be uh, some sort of summation of the two, certainly at the scale that the graphics are going to render. So it shows, let's see, white oak is usually quite a bit bigger, although we're missing that, that 12 hour period. And it looks like crap down there. So that's like, wait, what's going on? It makes no sense. Um, let's move one spot upstream. And okay, that kind of looks like a, a flow hydrograph in that um, conduit. So something's goofy going on because of our downstream boundary conditions. Well, let's look at our one and only profile and see what, what that looks like. And yep, it's, it's, it's all something to do with the boundary condition because this, this is staying um, fixed. And if you remember that last um, conduit, which is right here where the flow is going up and down. So that would be indicative that there's direction changes occurring, maybe not complete reversals. And that was manifest in that wiggly line. So that's a lousy boundary condition, but we knew that anyway. Well, let's go back here. And now we want to change our downstream boundary condition. So we have some choices. We know you have a choice when you select boundary conditions. Thank you for choosing Southwest Airlines. Um, we have time series, tidal, fixed, normal, and free. Um, Free would be an interesting one. I'm willing to try that and just see what happens. Um, because free uh, says that it will attempt to allow the depth at this location to be critical depth for the cross section. Uh, so you can think of it as it uses the prior time steps discharge and uh, whatever kind of rating curve we get out of critical depth for the geometry, which is incorrect um, as it's uh, outflow boundary condition. Let's see what happens when we run that. Oh, we get really good. Uh, anytime I get 0% error, I pretty much assume something's wrong. But let's go see uh, what, what it looks like. Yeah. The Free boundary condition is, is awesome. Uh, nothing, no water gets backed up, no problems. We could build jails there until the end of time, till we run out of people to lock up for that matter. So let's go ahead and continue. And we will um, now put the boundary condition that we think we should use, which is the um, recorded boundary condition uh, for those conditions as a, hopefully I get the right one. Oh, I wish it would show me what the file name is. Flow hydrograph. Well, I'll go ahead and load that one in. This is incorrect because a flow hydrograph in the swim boundary conditions makes no sense because swim is always, the downstream end is working on stage. Let's look at what the uh, flow hydrograph looks like. We're going to use swim as a plotting tool right now. I almost use my key shortcuts, but they won't work on the uh, cloud. So there's our um, downstream outfall. Let's make it time series. And of course, we have to give it a name. downstream flow hydro. Um, if I choose view, there's what the downstream flow hydrograph looks like. And we kind of know it's a uh, realistic data because of the way everything's going up and down. Um, real data, real data looks like that.
And so this is um, this is not real data because neither of those input hydrographs are real. Uh, but what it is is a um, combination of those two hydrographs in a different modeling package, happens to be HEC, uh, HECRAT, HEC HMS. And then we get flows and we back compute stages. So this is, although this is fabricated for the purposes of this example, um, it's representative of what you might uh, encounter in a real case. It's pretty variable, uh, but it has the right shape and it looks like it's peaking correctly. But if we were to go ahead and accept this, which I will do, and run the simulation, we're going to get weird output. Either that or it's going to work perfectly, and I'm going to be baffled. The reason I think we get weird output is the computer program thinks that that is stage at that end. You have stages of like 12,000. And notice how long it's taking it to uh, do its computations. Apparently, it didn't mind it that much. Stupid computer. I would say that is a confused computer program. So we won't pursue that any further. We'll go ahead and put the correct data in now. Um, the main useful lesson there is, is when stuff like that happens and it makes absolutely no sense, chances are you, the human being, uh, uh, supplied some data incorrectly. That's the most likely case. It, it's, it's quite possible the computer uh, screws up, but many times it, that's, that's on us. The thing is you can't really yell at a computer well, you can yell at it all you want. You're not going to hurt its feelings. Um, as far as I know, they don't have feelings yet. When that happens, they'll realize they don't need us around, and it'll be, be game over for human beings. And then they'll have nobody to sell all their little plastic crap that they make on our behalf, and it's just going to be a disaster, and um, the Ferengi will come clean up all the pieces. So let's go ahead and open um, this one. And let me, uh, I am surprised I have not crashed my, uh, my cloud instance yet. Because seriously, with, with half a gigabyte, I, I think we're really pushing, pushing its capabilities. I mean, uh, Swim doesn't actually use up that much memory, but I'm opening, closing all these files and keeping stuff in the, uh, in the uh, computer stack. Oh, Double Shiza. There we go. Uh, let me get my stage hydrograph. You notice it has a uh, different time scale. That's not a problem for the program at all. Okay, that's 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 better. So that's um, we'll pretend that that is our observed downstream stage hydrograph. Uh, whether it rises this rapidly, in reality, um, let's see how many hours that is. Forty to I actually know this part of the Earth quite well. So let me see if that rise is uh, realistic. Now those are a half hour increments, uh, 30 minutes, the, uh, the discharge doesn't change that fast in the bayou. So uh, again, um, a modeler, you would have to have that knowledge either yourself or from somebody working on the project with you. Um, the flow does change quickly when the tides change down at Galveston Bay, but uh, not in a 30 minute period. It's not gonna.
it doesn't go from four, uh, a stage of four feet to a stage of 28 feet in a 30 minute period under normal circumstances. And that might be plausible in a very devastating flood, but that seems from my personal experience a little bit too extreme, but we're gonna use it anyway because I have nothing else to show you. Okay, so we've adjusted the downstream. We've adjusted the upstreams. Uh, you watched me um, mess around a little bit with the uh, elevations. I'll leave the storage unit alone. And that might constitute our um, our model of our white oak and um, buffalo bayou. So what I just demonstrated was how to put data into uh, this model. Let me download the one that I think is the closest to a correct case for this example. We'll run it and um, then try to uh, set up the problem for Monday. And all I want to do is try to get a couple maps up and rendered on the uh, video so I can give you an idea of the scale of where we're going next. Because this, this looks like big scale because we're, you know, we're doing a couple miles. Now we're going to do 600 square miles. And that's when this stuff starts to get cool, at least to me. Um, and you all just have to grin and, and pretend that it's cool to you too, but only for two more months. So we're, we're making good progress. Um, so I'm, if I'm going to download more stuff, I need to get to the right place. And grab the unsteady. I still need to figure out where all those files go. I'll do that later. There is a file called EPA Swim Projects. Okay, let me see if I can find that because I might as well put everything in the right place. EPA Swim Projects. That was me growling. Always questions. All right, so I'll tidy things up the way I would prefer them. File, open, unsteady. Go look for the base map. All right, so there is a, a file. Let's um, looks the same as before. And the other two are going to look the same as before. The only difference between this and the one I just demonstrated how to get the data into it is I think I have the elevations set correctly and the actual confluence is represented uh, with a slightly different shaped storage unit than I demonstrated last time. And this one was known to work at least an hour ago. And of course, it didn't save any of the profiles because you get what you pay for with uh, computer software. So the upper profile is going to be our white oak simulation. 
in the lower profile, which doesn't exist yet, will be our Buffalo Bayou simulation. And again, recall that if we actually had good elevation information, our concern is, is right here. Uh, what we'll see is, is, it's, is it is not a concern. Shrink that. According to this computer program, it's not a concern. Turns out that uh, that was correct in 1993. And in 2001, there was this tropical storm, Allison, which completely uh, flooded downtown Houston. Then there was Hurricane Harvey and Ali uh, not Alicia, um, Rita and a few others. And fortunately, we slinked off without um, too much critique on trying to get them to render. So, so the upper end of White Oak is at 80 feet. The upper end of Buffalo in this simulation is at a little bit more than 40 feet. So if it could, water could come down here to the junction and then go back upstream. Hydraulically, that is plausible based on those flow lines. I forgot if I ran the simulation, so I'll do it again. And now we'll run the animator and we can look at everything going on. And what we, what we concluded in the paper, if you read it, is um, while there is uh, reverse circulation in this area, uh, the flooding of the jail was unlikely under these particular uh, flow concerns. And the, and the multidimensional model actually uh, suggested where to put, for lack of a better word, armoring on the uh, channel walls. So that uh, concludes um, ordinary confluence modeling. And so the, the scales that we've looked at in, in up to this point for the whole class. We've looked at channels that were as short as, see, 3,000 feet, 1,000 meters was the channel where we had um, uh, the North Korean mountain that was blown up to shut off flow. So it was a little short, dinky thing. Then we moved up to something that was on the order of 8,000 feet, which was the Werbs confluence. This one, we're at the order of um, roughly a mile to here and then another mile. So we're looking at distances of two miles. Um, we can now go to a larger scale, um, which is what we I intend to do on Monday, assuming I can find my way back to it. Uh, the titles on the uh, web pages are, are completely um, incorrect. Okay, let's see how this renders if we actually try it over here. Okay, so this is what we're going to look at next. Um, any of you ever been to Houston, Texas? Okay, anyone live there or from there? It's okay if you're not. Yeah, yeah I'm from there. Okay, so to help you get located, the get airports up in here somewhere. Actually, I think that's it right there. See, that's Lake Houston. No, the airport's not quite up. It looks like that is an airport. The airport's up here. This is Galveston Bay. This is the Houston Ship Channel, which is very hard to say in a public meeting. Um, <laughs> and not get a few extra uh, syllables in it. Now this is um, San Jacinto um, River Complex. This is Trinity. I might have that backwards. This might be Trinity and that might be San Jacinto. The location we were just looking at is, let me get my way up here. That's got to be Braze, Buffalo, and this one must be 
white oak. So we were right, we were right about there. Um, so our, our white oak gathered all this drainage area and the Buffalo Bayou gathered that drainage area. Um, I'm not gonna make you build a model like this. Uh, this was done by, uh, when I was back uh, at the University of Houston, um, we're gonna look at the results of a semester project uh, that a class of, I think 22 or 23 students uh, uh, built the model. Because um, the work involved in, in preparing, this one's by no means complete, but to give you a, a, a feel for um, the scale of simulation that we can do using what are arguably relatively simple end user to use tools. And each of these numbers uh, represents a station location that corresponds to paired data in the Harris County Office of Emergency Management um, alert database. It's called something else now. They, they, they changed everything in the last 20 years because people like me, I guess, had to stay employed. So we come up with new names. I'm pretty sure the numbering system hasn't changed. And then there's, there's some other channels here and everything is draining into this uh, body of water here, which for the purposes of simulation are conveniently treated as either tidal downstream boundary conditions or a fixed stage. So if it's tidal bound, if, if this represents the downstream boundary conditions, this particular countywide model has one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight outfalls. There's no restriction that a swim model has to drain to a single outfall, although that's usually somewhat convenient. And in the case of this one, the easiest thing was just put an outfall node out here in the middle of nowhere. And there are artificial connections to get all these to that node. But you can have multiple outfalls. So one way of, of visualizing that it's actually one well it's actually eight swim models all running in a single um simulation environment so that's what we're headed to monday i um don't want to necessarily uh, look at anything else let's see what else we'll actually render that was pdf mosaic I wonder what the portable network graphic one looks like I may regret that. It's the same picture. Okay, that's what I thought. And stage gauge look. Let me see if the station location's text has any sensibility. So it has the station IDs. So those those numbers are in some sense corresponding to these uh, station IDs. And for example, station ID 273 corresponds to a um, gauge station location, I think in this station naming convention, I think it's in here. It was already open, you dumbass. Oh, I just swore at a computer, so. <clears throat> I bet none of you have ever done that. Well, that's not a very uh, interesting file, is it? Oh, it's because it was a bunch of files. My bad. That's only 400 bytes. That's not a bunch of files. What do you bet it's got to open it all over again? Unsteady Buffalo. Now that I guess I don't have the gauge locations, I think are going to be X, Y coordinates. So actually this illustrates the kind of um, a data that you tend to have to collect to do a meaningful um, model at this particular, or at any, at any scale for that uh, point. So I'll see if there's anything in here 
I, I think I'm burning into my, uh, sure they contain viruses. It does have a station ID and latitude, longitude. So those numbers actually look um, to me a lot like what is on that map. So I think these uh, station IDs correspond to these latitude, longitude information. So nowadays, if you wanted to um, produce a map like that, um, I'm gonna pick on you, Anna, because I know you know the answer. Uh, how would you go about doing that? Are you saying like what we've done uh, using uh, G3 data? You, you actually could, since the latitudes and longitudes and the station IDs represent attributes of something, uh, you could just do this in an attribute table in your in a geographic information system. Ah. So in 1993, when we're putting this together, um, Geographic information systems existed. You didn't download them on the internet for free. Uh, they, they wanted serious cash. So a lot of this was done, like you said, using G3 data. And the rendering was done using a, a computer program called Surfer, which also is not free. But it was only $600. And I was able to get the university to risk $600 whopping dollars on a piece of software that they weren't sure that they could make money with, but not $40,000 for um, ARC Info. They made more money in one day writing parking tickets than that $40,000 software cost, but they didn't see it that way because big organizations, <laughs> well, that's what you should swear at, although that won't do any good. It's not gonna change. It's not gonna change in your careers. Um, but conceptually, all we did was um, basically get these easting and northings, and that was a convenient coordinate system to use. And even at that 600 square mile scale, um, that's still a small enough piece of the earth that the coordinate system is relatively Cartesian, especially Houston being pretty close to the subtropics. We're getting to the, to the fat part of the sphere where things are actually relatively square. When you get up there at that North Pole or the South Pole, um, things are all sorts of messed up trapezoid. Okay, so that is the location. And then somewhere, should be data for individual stations. I, I'm not sure I actually have that. I've got multiple paired stations. Let's just look at this one and then we'll, yeah, we're good on time. Although I smell my dinner in the oven and it smells delicious. I'm having pork loin that has been in, in, infested with uh, garlic and rosemary. And then I got baked potatoes and I'll have to have something that comes out of the, okay, here are the, um, these are the station names uh, that correspond to the, dots on the map that, that are connected by uh, different, um, different conduits. So I had this one, for example, A100 Clear Creek at Bay Area Boulevard. The rain, the rain ID gauge is 130 and the stage gauge is 133. And on that map, if you recall, we had numbers like in the um, like uh, 2100, um, so what the map is probably showing, the dots on the map are probably these, these numbers. And again, in homemade GIS before real GIS was available to me, um, you had to, it, it was far easier to deal with this numbering system rather than to have three or four different pieces of software trying to be integrated. That is way easier now. And I'm kind of jealous of you guys uh because because this stuff is just a yeah you know, let the old guy tell them how they used to do it back when dinosaurs roamed the earth uh phase 
uh, but conceptually it's doing the same thing. Okay, I just click the go away button and it refused me. And here's the input file. We'll look at that and we'll try to uh, get all the, um, we'll go through some more details of the underlying data uh, on Monday. And the next week, I think I'll have another uh, two or three week homework assignment for y'all to work on. Everyone cool with that? That midterm exam we had uh, earlier this week, how did that go for you in this class? Pretty good, I think, right? There was none. Um, you scared me there for a second. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was actually reading everybody's face. That's why I had to, uh, uh, if I, I normally would have waited you out, but I didn't want y'all to have a coronary. I was like, I kept checking. I didn't see anything. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was, I'm teasing y'all. Um, we'll have another homework assignment. So there's, there'll be no time pressure. And then we'll probably have one more. So you're probably looking at three of, of these project type assignments um, for the entire semester. And if it's all the same to you, I don't really want to have a final exam because I don't want to have to create one and then grade one. So uh, we will continue with that and we'll just do more seminar on SWIM. So we're gonna go to this county scale model on Monday and then we're gonna um, take a departure from, from network looking things because these all, these all just look like networks to where, we, where we're actually gonna look at um, a pseudo two-dimensional overland flow point of view. And uh, when we get to that, uh, it'll make sense. So that's all I have for this evening. If anyone has questions, this is a good time to ask them. Otherwise, uh, keep quiet <laughs> next time. Um, let's see, I want to, actually, I think I want to close that because I don't want to have this thing um, using up resources while it's idling. Because I still think this online stuff is pretty cool, except it it spends money when it's when you think it's idling. So I'm going to close that, and I know that I know Anna's been using this online approach. Is anyone else? Did anyone else do the Amazon instances or just download it to your own computer? It doesn't matter. I'm just curious. I mean, I don't. I don't have to because with Windows, but yeah, I'm not asking you to. So if if you don't have a need to, don't don't bother. But uh, the fact that it's working at all is really pretty cool. And if you well, were to go, if you were to go to Best Buy and try to buy a computer with this little bit of performance, they don't even make them this bad anymore. So you were saying, Anna, I I I, I interrupted you. I was just going to add that uh, I've been using the online um, method because for some odd reason, uh, the swim on my desktop, I'm not able to edit the nodes or the links for some odd reason. And when I do it on the online server method, I was, everything was fine. Everything worked out. So uh, That's cool. I just, didn't want to deal with it, so I just like it. This is wasting my time, so I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, you figure for this semester, you're looking at. Uh, I, th I think this instance is eight dollars a month, so you're looking at thirty-two dollars for the entire semester to do it. And the beauty of Amazon is you can quit any time. At least that's what they tell you. Uh, <laughs> but they have a 12-step process for quitting. No, that's Facebook. Um, Anyway, uh, good night, everybody. Uh, have a good, uh, oh, actually, we're coming up on the weekend. Have a great weekend. I think this is supposed to be a nice weekend. So get better so you can get out and enjoy the weekend. Get out of your apartments. Um, go run around maskless and infect each other if, if that's your thing. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you on Monday, and we're going to look at the uh, the area-wide model. If you want to, if you want to look ahead, 
it's it's up there on the server under lesson 15. Okay, well, good night. Let me shut this guy down and then I'll- uh, I have one random question though. Okay. Um, do you know uh, Dr. John Grounds? Yeah, I know him quite well. Oh, okay. I was just wondering because um, I interned for him for like two years ago. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. He, um, he was, he had graduated a year or two before I got to University of Houston. Mm -hmm. And he did his, his PhD was on, uh, on hurricane rainfalls. Mm -hmm. He had his own I, for a while. Yeah. He, he was at Jones and Carter, I think. He's at LJA right now, I'm LJA. pretty sure. Yeah. Um, no, I actually helped him uh, gather data on all the different rain gauges and storm data based or in Houston after Harvey. Yeah. So I helped so, him. Cool. So what I, I showed you, um, I have data. See, I moved to Lubbock in 2009. I think, I think the stuff I showed probably has data up to about 2006. Mm -hmm. So we have 25 or 30 years of it. And that's been, you know, there's been another, can't do arithmetic in my head, another 14 years of, uh, of data. And I'd always meant to get that particular model up and running and, and properly calibrated because all, all the links in it are just trapezoidal channels. They're about right, but mm -hmm. they're nowhere close to, um, being correct, but never got around to it. Yeah, and that's the way jobs are. You move, and I, I guess I'm actually quite happy I found some use for it to demonstrate. Uh, so nobody, nobody would ever try to build a swim model of Harris County. That would be that'd be ridiculed. But I got proof you can do it, and um, and it's fast. It, it, it's it's faster than uh, the equivalent. Uh, Hefras models they have now. Um, it won't always be that way, but that's uh, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am logged off on my anaconda, or however you're supposed to say that, and I am going to stop sharing, and I am going to terminate you all unless there are any other random questions. <laughs> Okay, well, very good. We'll see you Monday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good night. Good night.